I did not know I was going to be able to do that. And I spent 26 miles not knowing if I was going to be able to do that. And I did it. And in that moment, realized that I had reclaimed something that had been taken. You grew up with like brothers and sisters. Um, did you ever struggle with people around you wanting you to be like more ladylike, you know, that stereotype? And because you want to play, like I know in my history, like I wanted to play. I had an older brother. I wanted to do everything he did. And then so sometimes people around you be like, oh, well, do a ladylike thing. So I was wondering, did you have yeah. that? Experience? That's a great question. And I think thanks for asking it. Um, not necessarily. So I, and I, I guess I will say within my immediate family, no. Now, society writ large, lots of things. I grew up, I, I was born in the early 70s. I was in high school in the 80s. If you have seen those big hair pictures from, I didn't ever have, I couldn't do that, but um, that was my moment. So there was a lot of cultural norm. If you watch film movies from the 80s, I mean, there's a lot of weird gender dynamics that, that are, were going on. In my actual household, my sister and I are the oldest. She's the oldest than me, and then we have four younger brothers. And there's 14, more than 14 years between the oldest and the youngest. So there's a big, big spread there. So to be honest, uh, for much of my growing up, because she and I were the oldest and we were the biggest for quite a while, you know, we really got to drive things. Uh, and, and in the household, my parents were very much about um, equality, if not in all areas, at least attempting. You know, I, I did grow up in a family where you didn't get, if you were a boy, you did not get excused from dishwashing and laundry folding and the rest of it. And if you were a girl, you didn't get excused from doing yard work or, you know, figuring out how to take care, do some simple fixes to furniture in the basement with the, you know, tools. So that was a real, I mean, I'm lucky in that way. Uh, I was also a spitfire and that's probably the nicest way I can say it. I, I suspect I was a handful. Uh, and I didn't take much guff from anyone. I was very, you know, opinionated at the age of five, six, and seven. So, yeah, I was lucky in that way. I do know as I got a bit older that the tension between those got greater, right? In order to be popular, you were to do certain things. I, because I was not popular, and therefore I guess I decided I wasn't going to be, I just found my way to people that, uh, didn't care quite as much. So, you know, I, my senior year of high school, I had a, one of my good friends on our, on our track team, you know, he had a old like VW bus and he and I, and a couple of other friends, we used to like go in that thing and drive out in the middle of nowhere and just go like run up around mountains and jump into, you know, bodies of water where, you know, I think back to it now, I think we could have all died and nobody would have found our bodies for days. Um, and that was good fun, right? It's not everybody's high school adventures, but it was mine. So, you know, I, I guess I would say I was lucky in that way. Uh, I will just finish up on this topic by saying that I did, and this, it's interesting, I think this loops back, I don't know why this is coming up so much, but it loops back to my commentary about this place of running and um, and thinking about dynamics within, within faith communities. Again, I mentioned I was raised Catholic and I, um, years ago, I mean, at this point, 10 or 15 years ago, I don't even remember when it came out. I have a, a, an essay that I wrote in a book. I was actually tied to that blog that I was writing, but this book came out and I have an essay in there that talks about uh, kind of coming of age as a girl in that, in that, in the church, in this moment in the 1980s. And it sort of starts off by saying, you know, I was confirmed wearing this little bubble skirt. That was a whole thing in the 80s that I used to that when my great like sort of when my grandparents were around or when I was supposed to be demure you it was like a long skirt but then you could button it up and make it into a short skirt and I say something in that essay about you know sometimes I would button it up and show off my runner's legs you know and kind of remind myself that I was you know I was as powerful as all those boys out there right this sort of thing so yeah I was lucky I would say I was very very lucky um in that way I didn't uh, you know I think I just did my did my own thing. Not that I wasn't aware of it, but 
Um, yeah, I, I didn't feel quite as many limitations as perhaps other folks did. You just kind of touched on something that like I have been kind of focusing on since like our, like I, I said, we talked about mental health and just, um, I think at a certain point that like we realized that we were powerful and that we did hold power and um, not even just in the way uh, that you're speaking to in the beginning, but that like as a valuable person um, that we could, ch we could like create this change for ourselves. When did that perspective shift for you? Like when in your life did that happen? Do you think it was like always with you? Like even when you were really struggling um, and, and pov in, in poverty, um, because that kind of um, like lack of power can lead to like depression and other things too. Like when did that come like show up for you in your life? Another very good question. Um... I definitely had a sense of this when I was when I was quite young. I think I lost that for a good portion of my teens, 20s, frankly, and 30s, where I really came to understand myself as having value only either in relation to other people or in relation to accomplishments that were external that I could prove. You know, could I get it good enough grades? Could I um you know, manage relationships, you know, was I a good mother? Could I get a job, uh, you know, in this field? Could I, like all of these external pieces uh, and not ever quite realizing that just being was good enough. Um, there were just a lot of expectations and it's, you know, a lot of expectations. I had a lot of expectations on me from my family of origin. I, I, you know, had expectations on me professionally. We had a lot of financial, you know, finances until fairly, you know, much later in my life than maybe some people were not, were not something that I ever felt quite comfortable with. So I will say that it took me quite, quite a long time to get there. Um, and but the fact that I knew, I, I think part of what has kept me going and part of what probably kept me going all those years was that somewhere deep down inside, I remembered this feisty little girl who was, um, you know, I mean, I was this freckle faced, fairly outspoken, um, red haired kid who took, who had a lot of things to say to about all the things all the time. Um, I was a good, I was a good student. I was a really good, you know, good kid, but I was, you know, I remember I got in trouble in elementary school because I didn't want to play pillow polo with the girls in gym class. I wanted to play floor hockey. I didn't want to do whatever. I remember something. It's like, I don't know, something we were supposed to do outside in the fall one year and the boys got to play flag football and I pitched a fit because I played, had been playing football at my, my family for years and I've got a wicked like right arm and I can throw an awesome spiral to this day, which my now 19 year old son will affirm. I still, I can't, now I can't be quite so nimble and I can't jump over anybody in the end zone to catch anything, but Thanksgiving day f football games, oh, I can QB like nobody's business, right? And so I had that, like that feisty bit that was there and it was there somewhere buried really deep down. And, um, you know, I, it took me a long time. I will say that I think the moment, part of why I've talked about this triathlon quite a bit was that that moment for me really crystallized, oh my gosh, like this is a thing that I am doing for me. I'm doing it for nobody else. It does not matter. It doesn't matter two hoots to anybody else. But I was so proud of myself for taking the risk. And in that moment, I realized as that day was going on that that um, it didn't need to be about anybody else. <laughs> and I was good enough no matter what happened. Like if I, getting to that starting line was, was an accomplishment and getting to the finish line, it didn't matter if it was gonna take me 20 hours. Like I, you know, it didn't matter. It was something that I never thought I could do and it wasn't for anybody else, it was for me. And I, and then I will just mention that in 2000 and, 16, 2016, I think that really where this, I became crystal clear about this in 2016, 
just a couple weeks after the presidential election, which I know put a whole lot of us, um, no, that's not true. I'm sorry. Wrong dates. It must have been the following year. Sorry. I'm, I should check my dates before I tell you stories about things. Uh, in the midst of the last administration, and it was just following along um, a week or so of what had been the really challenging, nationally challenging um, Supreme Court justice uh, hearings, Brett Kavanaugh's hearings that were really all about, you know, the allegations of sexual assault and carrying on. Um, the weekend following the closure of those hearings, I ran a marathon in New Hampshire that began in place A and ended on the campus of a university where I had been raped when I was 18. And I had never been back to that place in, it had been almost 30 years. Never wanted to be in that place, never wanted to talk about it, never wanted to go near it. And I signed up for that marathon knowing full well that when I got to the end, the to, miles 26 to 26.2 were gonna take me from a, from a public road onto that campus and I was gonna to have to cross the finish line in that space. And I tell you this because that experience was transformative. I did not know if I was gonna be able to do that. And I spent 26 miles not knowing if I was gonna be able to do that. And I did it. And in that moment realized that I had reclaimed something that had been taken, right? And in that moment really began to realize that this was about something bigger. Um, and, and, and in that moment got a new sense of finding myself and my strength in ways and re realizing where maybe some of that had gotten lost along the way. It's, you know, I mean, it's, a, and I say this knowing that it's, that's not the whole story, right? And it's no story is ever like, that's the whole thing, but it was incredibly powerful. I, and I didn't know, and it was a risk and it was a challenge. Um, and I have run that race. Uh, I've run that race two, two other times since then. Uh, and it's, it's powerful, but that day was incredibly powerful. And I, I do think that that was a moment, you know, get well into my forties where, where the, uh, the refinding of, of myself was part of that. You know, I would not be giving this interview with you, you know, a decade ago. I was not in this place a decade ago. Wow, thank you for sharing that. That's impactful. That you're right, it's completely powerful. So hard to overcome it. You like faced it. A anger inspires me. If you get that, I will say, righteous anger usually. Yeah, uh, it's that. Those are those are powerful um, emotions. Uh, whether it's about something of myself or or meditating on um, meditating on women's lives over the centuries, who have been mistreated, harmed, women who have stood up against all the odds, like all the odds, um, from individual members of my family to major figures to folks I've met along the way. Like, it's amazing to me. Those are the people that I, that I carry with me, you know, always trying to remember if, if other people could do whatever it was they did, you know, literally and metaphorically, I can keep putting one foot in front of another. Now, and not every day does it feel quite so inspiring, but that I'm very intentional about thinking about that. And it has been, um, it has been helpful to me.